Now, here's your Nightline host. Good evening and welcome to Nightline. It's raining, raining, raining on the outside here. I hope it's raining, raining, raining where you are. So that means showers of blessings on the outside, and you're going to have showers of blessings on the inside. Tonight is going to be a night that you need to get your paper and pencil. And you need to get your Bible, because we're going to have a Bible story like you have never, never had. This lady that has come to be with us tonight, she's going to warm your heart. She's going to, she's going to educate you. She's going to move you closer to doing things for God. The, she's going to be talking about the most important book in the entire world. But she's also going to be exposing what some people want to do with God's Word, do to God's Word. Tonight, you are really going to learn lots. I heard of her. I, I was spellbound to hear her on the radio a couple of times. And I could, I was driving down the road, and I wanted to pull over and get my Bible to see what she was talking about. But I listened to every word, and I'm sure I missed a lot because I couldn't get my paper and pencil. So I'm telling you beforehand, you need to get paper and pencil, or paper and pen, because you need to write things. You need to check our guest out tonight. She comes highly, highly recommended, and you're going to be blessed by her being here tonight. I'm not even going to tell you who she is. I, you're going to have to wait until I introduce her. But you're, you need to call a friend, or you need to call a Bible scholar, or you need to call someone that doesn't know Jesus. Because I'm telling you, the end time is near. And we want our friends, our enemies, everybody to get ready to meet Jesus. And the Bible says that in the very end time, even the very elect will be deceived. That can be by the material you read, by the television programs you watch, by the movies you go to, by the preachers you hear. It doesn't matter who it is. If they don't line up with the Word of God, then you better check it out. You better check it out. We are too close to the end to fool around with people that are deceiving us. So tonight, we want to know the truth. The truth sometimes hurts. Sometimes we have to be chiseled off a little. But I'm willing to be chiseled here. I'd rather be chiseled on earth than be chiseled when I stand before God. So if we're wrong, we need to know. And if they're wrong, we need to know. So tonight, get your paper and pen and be ready to write down scriptures. Get your, get your Bible because we're going to have a Bible course like you've never had before. Even Bible scholars are going to be really shocked at some of the things we're going to hear tonight. But it's all truth, and we need to know about it. The enemy is working on every hand to deceive us in every area. And tonight, there's a, there's a meeting going on at Hillcrest High School. And I wanted to be there so badly, but I, I wanted to be here too. So I couldn't be in both places. So we're just praying for the people that are watching here, and we're praying for the parents and the children down at the school meeting. Because it's a very important meeting with Barbara Nielsen. And I'm sure that they need our prayers and we need your prayers here. So we can learn in both areas. And if you have children, get involved. If you are a single parent, get involved. If you're just say, well, I'm just one person. But you are one person. Get involved in government, in church, in school, in home, community. Get involved. Because Jesus is counting on us. He really, really is. It's going to be a good program tonight. A little different type of program. But it's one that you're going to be blessed. And you're going to learn lots. Gwen is my co-host tonight. Gwen Hall, all the way from Asheville. Um, where else are you from? Candler. Candler. Up in Pole Creek. <laughs> well, let's leave that off. Candler. You look pretty tonight. Thank you very and, much. And what do you color do you call that? It's um, aqua green. Or it's an aqua green. It's very yeah. pretty. Thank you Welcome very much. to Nightline. Good to be here. It's always good to work <laughs> with you. Tonight, you and I are going to learn something. I'm excited about it. This is an encyclopedia of the Bible that's going to be talking to us. She's done her homework. And I like to sit before people that know what they're talking about. Oh, yes. I don't want to sit before people. Don't have time 
to sit before people that don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. But she does. Right. And we're going to be blessed tonight. Praise God. Start the things off best by the Word of God. Because that's what we're going to talk about. That's tonight. right. What have you got for we're us? We're going to be reading from 2 Timothy tonight. Second chapter, the 15th verse. Where it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yes. And also, over in the third chapter, in the 16th verse, it says, For all scripture is given by inspiration of God, mm -hmm. and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's exactly what we're going to be dealing with tonight, is knowing exactly what the Word of God says and That's rightly right. dividing the Word of God and the truth of it. That's right. And if anybody comes in any other, other name, with any other material, mm -hmm. I don't care how many holies it has across the front of it, that doesn't mean that the inside is holy. That's right. And so we better be careful. We better know what we listen to, better know what we read. It's so important. And know what your children read and what they listen to. We want the truth, regardless of who gives it out or where it comes from. If it comes from this book, it is the truth. Tonight, our very special guest who's come to be with us from Ararat, is that right? Uh, Virginia, Ararat? Ararat, Virginia. Ararat, Virginia. And her name is Gail Ripplinger, uh, Ripplinger. Ripplinger. And you are the author of the New Age Bible Version. My, my. Welcome to Nightline. Thank you so much for it's having me. It's good to have you. Thank you. I've been looking forward to you coming because what I heard you talk about is earth shattering, what people will try to do with God's Word. But before you tell us about the New Age versions and what's happening, we know a little something what's happening in the schools, but we want to learn what's happening to God's Word, how they're tearing it apart. Tell me something about you. You, if, you're from a large family, small family? Um, I'm an only child, an and I was raised child. in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a student at Kent State University. Uh -huh. And um, some Christians witnessed to me, and I became saved when I was in my late 20s. Mm -hmm. I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Mm -hmm. And uh, ever since then, it's just been a blessed journey, and uh, my sins were forgiven, mm -hmm. and I have a home in heaven, and I'm so grateful for that, and the Lord has blessed me so much since then. Um, and then I went on to be a professor at Kent State University. A professor? And, uh, right. Oh. Uh, the Lord didn't give me any children of my own. And so, until now, he finally did. You know, it was uh -huh. one of those late kind of things. Uh -huh. Age 39, he gave me a, a young daughter. But um, until then, the students at Kent State University were sort of like my children. Mm -hmm. I, I loved them and I cared for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Lord had sort of had a sense of humor. He knew that I would witness to the young students and because I cared so much for them. And, and students who are away at college by themselves get themselves into all sorts of trouble. And the yeah. young ladies would be getting themselves into all sorts of, you know, sin is, what, is really what it was. Yeah. They'd come crying into my office. It was a perfect opportunity to open the Word of God oh. and to share with them the precious Savior who'd saved me some 10 years earlier mm -hmm. and uh, was privileged to lead approximately 30 young ladies to the Lord oh, Jesus Christ wonderful. in the years I was there. So it was that's an honor great. to do that. A professor, now I consider a professor a very, very smart, educated person. And uh, teaching is, is, is it's got to be something. I've always said that there has to be a special place in heaven for teachers <laughs> because they're very special people and so much patience and so much knowledge that they're willing to share with everyone else in their classroom. But to go from the classroom to write a book. Well, you know, it's interesting. How did that happen? <laughs> it's interesting. Um, students were coming into my office, coming yeah. into my office with their problems, and I would share the Lord with them, and many of them mm -hmm. were saved. But I noticed over a course, uh, the course of uh, the 10 years while I was a professor there at Kent State that the, after they were saved, the young people who were using the new Bible versions, yes. the Living Bible, the Revised Standard Version, uh, the NIV Bible, the New mm -hmm. American Standard, were having more of a problem with their walk with the Lord than the students were using the King James. Now, um, I personally really didn't know anything about the difference between the versions. You yes. know, I'd never heard anything that there was a difference, you know. Yes. And so, um, one day a young lady came in my office and she was crying. And they were all crying. You know, the boyfriend breaks up with oh, them. Yeah. And they get a D on a chemistry test, and they go to Gail's office. That's where every pipeline went yeah. to Gail's office, you know. And so I would mother them. So I took this, this young lady, brought her Bible with her, and she opened up to, um, I said, let's look at Luke chapter 4, where it says, Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Because mm -hmm. 
the, the answer to her problems was not getting a better grade on the chemistry test or having the boyfriend come back because that's a temporary solution yeah. and she needs a permanent solution. So I said, let's look at Jesus. He came to heal the broken heart. So we opened her up, up her NASB and it wasn't there. That whole section had been taken out. And I was kind of surprised, and that was the first time I'd ever n known that there was a difference. So then I thought, well, perhaps we'll go to another verse. Uh, we'll go to the Old Testament, where it said, His mind is kept in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Mm -hmm. I thought, this young lady needs sort of like the radio channel. You know, sure. there's static on every channel in our life, except the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the, in his, he said, in me you shall have tribulation. Mm -hmm. oh, excuse me, excuse me. In the world you shall have tribulation, but in me you shall have peace. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I wanted to show this young lady, um, you can't go by circumstances. Sometimes they'll be good and sometimes they'll be bad. But in this world you'll have tribulation, but you need to focus your mind on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I wanted to show her this verse. In the NASB, they had omitted in me. So it just said, whose mind is steadfast. Well, before I was saved, I'd studied um, New Age philosophy and Eastern mysticism and all that sort of thing. And I knew that was exactly what the Eastern mystics were teaching people. Keep your mind steadfast on the mantra, meditate on this. And I thought, no, you know, your mind must be on Christ. And uh, so then I was very concerned. And so since I, I love these young people so much, I prayed to the Lord and I said, Lord, I need some time to look at these versions. I said, this needs to be a word-for-word -word collation. I like to be thorough on things I do. We need to start, you know, first word of the first sentence of the new versions and go right through. I want to see what's happening. Why have these changes taken place? Mm -hmm. And so the Lord was so gracious. Um, and I spent the next six years between um, four and 12 hours a day, more often 12 hours than four hours for six years, collating word-for-word -word the new versions of the Bible, comparing them with the authorized King James Version. Well, it didn't take me, you know, more than a month to find out that something, there had been egregious changes in the new versions. And as I found out at the end of the six-year study, that there have been 64,000 words taken out of the NIV. Now, these aren't words like thee and thou and flowery things that we don't need. These are serious things like the deity of Jesus Christ, how are we saved. Um, I noticed the young people who use the new versions, they seem very uncertain about their relationship with God. Uh, and I found out why, and I found out what was happening in the new versions that was making them have some of these problems that they had. Another young man came in my office and he said, um, they, these young people who were using the new versions were having doctrinal problems. Uh, this young gentleman came in and he said, can you tell me if Isaiah 14 is about Jesus Christ, or is it about Lucifer? Well, I knew Isaiah 14 is the biography of Lucifer. This is where Lucifer falls, and it says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Mm -hmm. And then it ends, he's cast down to hell. And I said, well, young man, that's the biography of Lucifer. And he said, well, my Bible says it's about Jesus Christ. And I said, oh, no, what do you mean by that? So we got his um, NASB, and I looked, and it said, how are you fallen from heaven? morning star, son of the morning. Then the little footnote took you over to a reference in Peter and a reference in Revelation where it takes you to Jesus Christ, the bright morning star. So obviously that footnote hadn't been there. If you knew your Bible, that would take you to our precious Jesus Christ, you know. So this young, all these pragmatic experiences were leading me to think I really need to look into this. And so um, that's how the Bible version, the New Age Bible version book came to be. Uh, you know, I cared so much about these students, I saw that, that they weren't getting the rest in the Lord that I was getting from my King James, and it just broke my heart. And so I thought, well, students at, at a university level are very um, much interested in having concrete information set before them. You can't just say, uh, I prefer the King James or something like this. You have to set before them some very concrete information. And so I set forth to do that in writing the book. <laughs> okay. Did the more you, the more information you gather, did you get disturbed? Oh, mercy. I, I would work, stay up late at night yeah. and by 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And I'd want to go run and wake up my husband and say, you know, look what they've taken out. It's, I was just so upset. And what I would recommend to anyone, um, you know, when they're hearing this and if they use an NIV, mm -hmm. I recall that years and years previous to this, someone had given me a little book. And it was about, you know, the the uh, superiority of the King James Version. And I remember quite honestly, Joanne, I thought that was hilarious. I mm -hmm. thought, that's, someone's taken a large portion out of that person's brain to think mm -hmm. that, you know. And so for the listeners out there, my heart goes out to them because I remember thinking, 
there's no difference and because we've been so programmed by a lot of the advertising and oh, some yes. of these things yes. and uh, it wasn't until I sat down and looked at them and the, and the Lord reminded me of the verse um, you know if a man answers a thing before he hears it it's a folly and a shame unto him he who answers a matter before yeah. he hears it and so you know that person gave me that book and I thought oh that's ridiculous you know I wouldn't even read the book because yeah. I thought it was so silly until I actually saw the problems the students were having and sat down and did a word-for-word -word collation it took me a year and a half just to do the New American Standard Bible 12 hours a day comparing it with the King James and then I went on to do um, the underlying Greek text I found out about the differences in the Greek text and then I started looking back at the manuscripts and altogether it took six years to what about John 3.16? Do they change it? Well, they do. They do. Now, Tell me. I appear, it appears that um, in some of the, the more important verses, the changes are not as egregious as mm -hmm. they are in some of the other versions. Mm -hmm. But John 3.16, um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay. Mm -hmm. In that verse in the King James, we have a begotten son. We have God manifest in the flesh. We have something very special that's happened here. You and I are sons of God, although we're women, we're still mm -hmm. sons of God, but we're not his begotten son, okay? Jesus Christ was his only begotten son. Right. Okay, in the NIV and all the new versions, they've taken out begotten, okay? And the Greek word there is mono, Ganes, mono, like mono rail, it just means one. Ganes is like Genesis, generated, okay? They only translate the mono part. They don't translate the Ganes part. And so they have the, the only son in the NIV. Well, then something, I noticed something strange was happening, Joanne. Uh, it said only son. Well, I thought, well, theologically, that's new because, not true because he's not, Jesus isn't his only son. He's his only begotten son. It's very mm -hmm. distinct there, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, when the NIV first came out, it said his only son, okay? Now, in the most recent printings of the NIV, in uh, John 1.14 and John 1.18, they've changed it. They've taken the word um, only son and they've dropped the son. And so the early NIVs and the late NIVs are not even the same. And so How many we have this difference. Well, the NIV New Testament came out in 1973. Okay. And then the whole Bible was available, I believe it was 79. And then I believe that that's when some of the changes started taking place. In fact, I think everyone sort of checked it out when it first came out, and they said, well, this is fine. We can give this to our, 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 the people in the pews and that sort of mm -hmm. thing, and now it's changing. And um, there are lots of other things that are different in the most recent NIVs than they are from the original NIVs. And so instead of being the only begotten son, which is a man, a son right. is a man, right. now it's the one and only. Okay, so there's no gender. They're the one and only. It's just this genderless person. So that can be bringing in new age where right, they think right. that God could be female. Right, right. Well, as a matter yeah. of fact, someone on yeah. the uh, NIV committee, Virginia Mullen, says that he is. Believes that he is. She is. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, my. So, uh, what does the Bible say about people that start messing with word, God's Word and changing it? And adding to and taking off. Right. Well, in the Old Testament, Serious. there's a, uh, an admonition in Jeremiah. It says, diminish not a word. Okay? So God is talking about individual words here. Diminish not a word. And then the very um, last uh, verse in the Old Testament says that if any man will um, add unto the things yes. that are written in this book. Yes. I will add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Mm -hmm. And if any man will take from the words of the prophecy of this book, God will take his part out of the book of life and out of the things um, which are written in this book and out of the holy city. So it seems to me that God uh, is charging us to be very cautious with the word mm -hmm. and not taking any words out here, no words out there, you know. There seems to be severe judgment for yeah. doing something like that. Gail, you probably have this said to you all the time. What, and what do you answer when someone says, but this is just the modern day of talking. If Jesus right. were alive today, he'd talk just like we did. Right. What right. do you say to that? Right. Okay. I, I was interested in that question, too. And so I did a collation using the Flesh Kincaid grade level indicator. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Flesh Kincaid is a company that was do, um, started a number of years ago. And they determined a mathematical formula for coming up with the grade level of a particular written piece of material. For instance, uh, the TV Guide is the fifth grade level. Mm -hmm. uh, the Wall Street Journal is 11th grade level. Mm -hmm. um, and so that a writer, a professional writer, can 
do this test on there, this mathematical formula having to do with the number of syllables uh, in a word and the number of words per sentence, they can do this sort of a big long algebraic formula and determine what grade level they're writing at. Okay, so I did this, it took me about six months just to do this one analysis. And in working with this Flesh Kincaid grade level indicator, it was determined that the King James is at the fifth grade level, okay? The NIV is at the eighth grade level, and the New American Standard Version and the New King James are both at the sixth grade level. So actually, pragmatically speaking, the King James is at a, an easier reading grade level for people. And I, I couldn't figure out why this was. Yeah. And so I studied it, and it was because the King James uses 95% Anglo-Saxon words. I believe Bob Jones University did a study a number of years ago that, that um, came up with 95% Anglo-Saxon words. Now, the Anglo-Saxon roots of our English language give us one or two syllable words, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, when we move into a Latinized kind of a vocabulary, we have three and four syllable words. And so if you look etymologically at the words in the King James Bible, you'll find that they're all Anglo-Saxon words. One syllable, two syllable words. The words in the new versions are Latinized words. They have prefixes, suffixes, and they're all almost three or four um, syllables long. So actually they're longer, actually they're more difficult. Um, I can give you some examples yes. if, you'd, if you'd like yes. me to do that. I think very much of what we've heard about uh, the King James being difficult is something that has come from um, the advertisers telling us, you know, now you finally have a Bible that you can understand. And, um, mm. you know, we know that the Bible is spiritually discerned anyway. So I think part of the reason people think that the King James is hard to understand is because it is hard to understand. Mm -hmm. It's God's Word, and he's, he's sort of set some seals over it, which I talk about in my book. And he, he doesn't open them to everyone. He opens them to those who obey and to, mm -hmm. to do what he says. But let me give you some examples of um, some of the differences in the words in the new versions. King James would say, rose up to play. Okay, that's four syllables. Uh, the NIV would say, indulge in revelry. Okay, so you have six syllables. Uh, King James told, Second Chronicles, um, NIV conscripted. Okay, three syllables, and I don't even know what conscripted means, okay. Um, old, in Hebrews 8, 13 in the King James, obsolete in the NIV. Um, called, one syllable again. The NIV replaces uh, old, um, called with designated. So you have a four-syllable word that's kind of difficult. And, and I'll give you some other examples from the New King James. The New King James is even more difficult to read than the NIV. Now, let me give you some examples. King James is smell, okay? New King James, savor, okay? Um, King James, house. New King James, habitation. Two or three or four syllables. Um, King James, um, man. New King James, mortal, okay? Um, King James, old, New King James, elderly. And this, I, I have a list, a listing in my book, probably of 10 or 15 pages, listing and showing time after time after time. They use a more difficult word, and I couldn't figure out why would they use a more difficult word yeah. if they're selling that they've, that they've actually used an easier word. Well, I found out why. Um, the King James is in uh, the public domain, okay? It's not copyright, so no one can take a profit from the King James Bible. As a matter of fact, during the tribulation, for those who are saved, they can publish King James Bibles in their basement, you know, if they mm -hmm. want to, and get the word out that there's no restriction with the King James Bible, okay? Now, there's something called a derivative copyright work, all right? You can take a work that already exists, and you can create what the copyright law calls a derivative work, but the copyright law says that there must be substantial changes. Those are the words that are used. And it said, a few words here and there won't do it. And so if they did take the King James Bible and change a few of the archaic words, there are probably 40 words in the King James that are truly out of date, although most of them are still, still in the dictionary, but I mean they're not commonly used, or maybe mm -hmm. the meaning has changed. But if you just took those 40 words and changed them, you couldn't copyright it. And if you can't copyright it, then you can't get, get the dollar back for every one that you're doing. And so I think what's happened is these advertising companies have taken over some of these. You know, the NIV was originally produced um, out of um, Calvin Seminary, and it was taken over uh, by the International Bible Society. Mm -hmm. And then the International Bible Society sold the printing rights to Rupert 
Murdoch. Now, we all know who Rupert Murdoch is now. Rupert Murdoch is the gentleman who tried to buy the House of Representatives. Remember, he offered him $4 million if he could have his book or something. Well, that same gentleman, Rupert Murdoch, bought out the printing rights to the NIV. So he now, the, the NIV is now owned by a secular publishing company. And so it's outside the, the hands of the Christian community. And as a matter of fact, it's with uh, something called Harper San Francisco, one of his branches, Harper San Francisco, uh, produces very, very blasphemous books about Jesus Christ, saying that he was a mystic and that his mother was raped and just horrible, horrible things. And so it's moved from, you know, a Christian milieu into a very, very sinister kind of, um, you know, mi multi-million dollar but which kind of translation a, is that? The New International Version. New International the Version. All right, uh, the King James Version, is it translated by man? Um... Men did the translating, but the way okay. I explain that to people, okay. um, there are four things we know about the scripture. The first is the verse that uh, Gwen read. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Okay, and so God inspired the original writers to write okay. the Bible. Okay, but um, He has also promised to preserve His word. It says in Psalm um, 12, verse 5 and 6, uh, the words of the Lord are pure words, tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times, thou shalt preserve them, O Lord, thou shalt keep them forever. So he promised to a pure word that would be preserved. It says in the Old Testament that he would preserve it to a thousand generations, okay? So he promised to inspire it, and he promised to keep it pure, and he promised to preserve it. So mm -hmm. I explained that uh, he, he inspired it, he promised to preserve it, and so it's still inspired. Now, I believe that anyone can go to Kmart or any place and buy a King James Bible, and when they open that, they are reading the Word of God. I think eight, seven or eight hundred times it says in the Bible, uh, thus saith the Lord. I think it's the most common phrase used in the whole Bible, mm -hmm. thus saith the Lord. These are the very words of God. Does so, the new version say that? Thus saith the Lord. Good question. I don't know. What they're taking out, though. I have a good idea that <laughs> they don't. That's something you to check out. Okay, what about um, who's behind all this changing of the Bible? Well, you know. Is I it a think, conspiracy, conspiracy? I think a lot of the people who have been on these new version committees are yeah. very sincere people. And I think Eve in the garden was very sincere. Yeah. Because when you look at what, she, what her options were, she saw that the tree was good. Mm -hmm to make one wise, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think the serpent has hung from the tree of wisdom. That's mm -hmm. where he started out, and he hasn't moved. And people have moved underneath it. And I think the, desi the desire to sort of help God out. Remember the story of the man in the Old Testament when the Ark of the Covenant was gonna fall, and this one man went over to try to help to it, it, and God killed him because he wasn't allowed to do mm -hmm. that. That wasn't his job. And I think some of these men, or most of these men, may have had good intentions, but I think they've moved under that tree of wisdom with the serpent hanging over it, and it, pride has entered in, perhaps, mm. because Lucifer fell through pride, yes. right? And, um, and I think some of these men have fallen through the same thing, and I think um, they were sincere, but sincerely wrong, because once they move under that tree, the very first thing, the very first question in the history of mankind is, yea, hath God said. That was the first question, and we're going to find out in these last days, this is the last question. Yea, hath God said. The scholars will question the King James Bible. Yea, hath God said. Did God say those 64,000 words that we've taken out? Mm -hmm. Yea, hath God said. The question mark there. And then what happens there? When you have God and His Word as the authority, one Bible, and God speaking in the garden, you have no division, okay? And God doesn't want division. All right, but when you introduce a second authority, that's the serpent, asking the question, yea, hath God said, and then Eve gets to be the arbiter. That's how she became God, or as gods. Mm -hmm. You shall become as gods. She became as gods by getting to pick. Do I pick the serpent, or do I pick God's word? And she became God in the sense because she was going to make a choice, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I believe God's written, given us the King James Bible. It, that is the Bible for the English-speaking world, okay? And I sort of think he did it once, and he doesn't have to do anything over again. He does such a good job whenever he does it. And so, um, I think 
when we have several authorities, whether it's a Greek scholar, a lexicon, several versions, then we have that option. We can pick what's God's word. Well, is this in or is this out or is this in? And then we do like Eve, you know, with good intentions, but it has a bad result. The result is the serpent gets to have his way, you know. Okay, now the new Bible says, as I say it, the new King James, the Amplified Bible, the Libyan Bible, New American Standard, the Phillips Translation, and the Jerusalem Bible. Do they all have errors that you found? Right, right. Now, we can look at all the new versions, mm -hmm. and they are all basically translated from the same Greek text type. In modern language, all these, um, are they in modern language? Well, they say they're in modern language, but when you actually sit and collate them, they're... But I mean, like the Living Bible, are they... Right in modern language like that? Oh, okay. Um, those versions that you mentioned are sort yeah. of on a scale, okay? okay? It would be like a baby falling down the steps. Okay. When you see a little baby falling down the steps, even if it's the first step, you go get him. Mm -hmm. It's not the distance, it's the direction. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I like that. And so what's happening with the New King James may not be quite as bad as the NIV, but it's one step down. We're going mm -hmm. down. The NIV may be a little bit worse. The new revised standard is much worse. And then we've got this new one coming out from Oxford Press, um, the inclusive Bible, where Jesus is now called the human one. That's his new name in this Oxford one. So it's just all downhill. The human one? The human one. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> right. Oh, he's not, he was human, but he was divine. Right, right. Okay, let's, let's get away from the questions here and tell me what you've done to your book. I want to talk about this right now. Okay. What, what did you do here? Tell me about this book. Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, New Age Bible Versions is uh, 42 chapters. It's 700 pages long, and it's divided into how the new versions change theology. Okay. okay. And basically, uh, when we look at the essential doctrines of Christianity, that would be number one, the deity of the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Uh, and John, John said, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So the reason the New Testament was written so that we would know who Jesus Christ is, mm -hmm. okay? And so when you look at the new versions, um, if I can give you a few examples, sure. Joanne, sure. about what happens to Jesus Christ in the new versions, okay? okay. Um, for example, um, he's the Lord, okay? Mm -hmm. Now we know there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, mm -hmm. one Lord. And so when they started recognizing that he was God manifest in the flesh, they would call him Lord. And the scribes and the Pharisees got very upset when they did that. Well, so what happens in the New Versions is that 31 times, Lord has been taken away from his name. Now, this affects the salvation of three or four people that I can remember in the New Testament. We have the woman caught in adultery in uh, John chapter 8, mm -hmm. and she said, Lord. Mm -hmm. She called him Lord, and as soon as she did that, he could forgive her sins. And he said, go and sin no more. When she was calling him Lord, she wasn't saying it just sort of like, like, dear sir, or something mm -hmm. like that. She was calling him the Lord of the Old Divine. Testament because there's only one Lord. And mm -hmm. she was saying, this is God. This is our, the Jehovah that, you know, we've known about for so long. Mm -hmm. And but in the NIV, they changed that. She doesn't say Lord. She says, sir. Okay, well, you don't get saved calling Jesus sir or calling someone sir. No, that's, no, no. that's politeness. That's not calling someone God. The same thing happens in the NIV with the thief on the cross. He said, Jesus, Lord, remember me. They take the Lord out, okay? So Jesus is just a name in the Mexican phone book. That was his human name. That's a name above all names. But when he called him Lord, he was saying, you are the God of the Old Testament that right. we, we've been waiting for. They took the Lord out there. When Paul got saved on the road to Damascus, this bright light shined in the sky, and he fell down, and he said, uh, Jesus said who he was. He says, I'm Jesus, whom, you're, whom thou persecutest. And he said, Lord. He called him Lord. As yeah. soon as he did that, that's when he got saved. They take that out. The Lord is out in, in that section there. Um, the Ethiopian eunuch, he said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? They take his whole salvation out of the NIV. They, he, uh, he said um, that he should believe that Jesus is the Christ, you know, the Son of God. They take Acts 8.37 completely omitted in the NIV Bible. It, his entire salvation is gone. And so uh, the purpose of um, the Bible is not only to tell us that he's Lord, but to tell us that he's the Son of God. Remember um, when Jesus was tempted of the devil, and mm -hmm. the serpent said to him, If thou be the Son of God. Yes. 
turn these stones into bread. Okay, we're going to find time after time in the NIV, in the NASB, and even in the New King James where they're removing sun. If I can give you some examples, okay. Joanne. Um, in Acts 8.37, where the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. That's taken out. Okay, Ephesians 3.14. Uh, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, they cut that off at Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is gone. Now, the reason that works into this new world religion is because all the religions of the world have a Father. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in fact, in Hinduism, they call people Baba. Baba Ram Das, Baba mm -hmm. this. Baba means Father. And so all the religions have this Father image, but not the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that comes off in, in the NIV in the, in the new versions. Ephesians 3.9 says, God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Okay, in the NIV, by Jesus Christ comes off. Okay, because the religions of the world would believe that God created all things, but not by Jesus Christ. Okay, Colossians 1, 2. So they're doing away Jesus as the right. divine. Right, right. As the Savior. Right, right. Well, the, the most uh, horrendous change that I think they've made is in uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, which is probably the strongest attestation to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, where it says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. They take out God there, and they just say, He who was manifest in the flesh. And so oh. he who could be anyone. You know, it's not God manifest in the flesh. And so, any chance they get, it's just a little watering down here, a little watering down here, a little watering down there. You know, the, the Egyptian magicians could imitate Moses up to a certain point. And mm -hmm. I, I perceive that some of these Bibles are imitating the true Bible up to a point. But in those true things where it's, um, you know, no one can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Well, if they take Lord out 31 times, it's apparent that the Holy Ghost is not leading them because if they're not saying Jesus is Lord. What do they say about the Trinity? Well, there are four strong verses in the uh, New Versions, or excuse me, in the New Testament that tell us that there's a Trinity. They've taken all four of them out. Um, 1 John 5, 7. Um, let me give you an example of uh, 1 John 5, 7, if I can find it here. Um, and there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That gives no the, son. That's right. That... Uh, gives the Father. Father. Well, the Word is Jesus Christ. Oh. So His name is called the Word of God, it tells mm -hmm. us in Revelation. Remember John 1, in the beginning was mm -hmm. the Word. That's right. Okay, so that's the name He's taken for Himself. I think okay. that's kind of interesting. That's good. But the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The strongest verse on the Trinity. It's completely omitted. Well, the NIV and the NASB do something really sneaky here. One of them takes part of verse 6 and sw puts it down into verse 7. Another one takes part of verse 8 and moves it up into verse 7, pretends it's verse 7. But if you look at very, very carefully. You'll see it's not in there. The other place that they take out, the other three verses on the uh, Trinity that they take out is the word Godhead. And in the Greek there, it's Theos, or Theotitos, or whatever, but it's still Theo, T-H-E-O. It's the word God, mm -hmm. okay? They take that out, and it's not capitalized anymore, and it's divine nature. And all the New Age people teach that we all have a divine nature. Yes. Yes. And so we don't have the Godhead anymore being distinct from creation, we have this divine nature that's in all people. And so basically the Trinity is very, very much missing, you know, except in a few places I'm sure it could be found in the new versions. But uh, The New Age, we hear that everywhere, <laughs> not just the Bible. The President says the New Age. Right. Everybody's talking about the New World Order. Right. Who is behind the New World Order? Who's behind all the new New Age versions of the Bible? Well, Do you think they're doing it deliberately or ignorantly? Um, I think that, you know, there, it says in the Old Testament there's a conspiracy of her prophets. The word conspiracy mm -hmm. is used in the Old Testament half a dozen times. So conspiracy is a Bible word, you know. But we have to be careful to stay within the parameters of the Bible when we're talking about conspiracies and all that sort of thing. But it says there's a conspiracy of her prophets. They put no difference between the holy and the profane, okay? So what's happened in the New Versions is the word holy is coming out all over the place. Let me give you a few examples, Joanne. Second oh, yeah. Peter 121, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy yes. Ghost. That's who wrote the Bible, the holy men of yes. God. The new versions just say men. They're not holy anymore. Well, at least they're honest about who wrote their versions. You know, they just say men wrote, not holy men anymore. Okay, mm. uh, Matthew 25, 31, holy angels, the King James. The new versions, they're just angels. Now remember, they're angels that fell. That's right. The Bible talks about 
Satan and his angels. And we see all this media blitz about mm -hmm. the angels today, mm -hmm. and I'm afraid people are getting into the wrong kinds of angels. I think so, too. I think so, too. Right, right. Playing right into their hands. Right, right. Uh, First Thessalonians talks about holy brethren, okay? Yes. And, you know, there's a prophecy in First Timothy that says, uh, in the last days men shall be unholy. Okay, what happens with that verse in the new versions? Instead of being holy brethren, it's just brethren. The holy's gone. Uh, the Bible talks about um, holy apostles and prophets in Revelation 18. Mm -hmm. Instead of being holy, the holy's gone in the new version. So it's just apostles and prophets. Well, we know they were false apostles, sure. false prophets. Okay, so we have to distinguish holy apostles. And then the word holy ghost, I think a half a dozen times where it says holy ghost, they take holy away from his name. Just now we know. Ghost? Well, no, it just says spirit. Oh, it just says spirit, well, right? That's, that's a different. They can, there's all kind of spirits. That's right. That's right. What about the resurrection? They, there are, um, the NASB is the most malevolent as far as what they do with the resurrection mm -hmm. because we only have two uh, places that talk about um, the ascension, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And what the NASB does is where it says, and he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshiped him. Okay, we have two things happening from there. There. He was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him. The worship would only be given to God, all right? And being carried up into heaven, we know he isn't here anymore. Well, the NASB just says he departed. They drop, they worshipped him. They drop that he went up into heaven. They just say he, was, he departed. Well, he disappeared. He disappeared. He went to India, right? He went horizontally. Um, mm. In the New Age, they teach that Jesus just left, he departed. As a matter of fact, those are the very words that words he used. He departed, went to India, became a sage there, and lived in the Himalayas for 2,000 years, and he's coming back. And they even said he was coming back to inhabit the Pope in Rome or something. So they say he never left, that he just went to India or he went to America, uh, where the Mormon people believe that he uh, appeared to someone. And so he didn't go Joseph up. Smith. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, listen, some of these things. What do you think there's going to be, keep on, people are going to write Bibles, and finally, God and Jesus will be out of all right, of them? Right, right. It's, it's, you know, remember in Genesis 3, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Yes. And it says, uh, I marvel that you are so soon removed from the simplicity uh, in Christ Jesus, uh, that you should be taken in subtlety. And so he always uses subtle things, you know, one inch at a time. And then people, when it's happened, people say, well, it's not that bad, you know. You've seen how things have changed over the years, yes. and the young people haven't seen this. And so I believe what will happen well, is that there will be a one-world Bible at some point in history, and the Antichrist will use that Bible to control people, because you can always use religion to get someone's emotions, to get them to believe, well, if God is saying this, this certainly mm -hmm. must be true. There's a group out in Phoenix, Arizona, they met last fall, called the Jesus Seminar. They're a group of very, very liberal theologians. I would hard, highly question if any of them are born-again Christians, okay? Mm -hmm. And they said, and this was um, in one of the major news magazines, if you think you have everything in your Bible you need, we don't. Okay, they have two recommendations. They want to get rid of the book Revelation, Okay, because they said it causes too much um, bad behavior. I don't know of any bad behavior that the book of Revelation Only the ones that go to hell can have <laughs> right. a bad behavior. That's right. Oh, so the book of Revelation is going to be taken out. They want to get rid of that because that warns us about the mark of the beast. Yes. That warns us about All the Antichrist. the devil's work. Right. And they well, what about Jesus coming? Do they believe in the second coming? Or is that just... The New Agers? Yeah. Okay, the New Agers are all prophesying a Christ. Okay. Uh -huh. And the Bible said that uh, a false Christ would come. The Bible mm -hmm. even talks about the false prophet and the Antichrist, okay? Mm -hmm. And I believe that these people will come into power, and they will, this Jesus Seminar group, they want to get rid of the book of Revelation, they want to add some of the books that were dropped out, what they say, during the fourth century now. Unfortunately, what those books are, are the Shepherd of Hermes, the Epistle of Barnabas, the Gospel of Thomas, Where did they find the Gospel books? of Mary. Well, they find In a them. a cave somewhere? <laughs> they find them in the NIV manuscripts. Okay, the Greek manuscripts that the NIV came from, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Sinaiticus has this Shepherd of Hermes right in it. And so all of these changes that we're seeing in the NIV and some of these new versions where they're dropping Jesus, dropping Christ, dropping how you get saved, all these sort of things, it's slowly happening. Someday they're going to say, we need to give you a full translation of the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts. We need to give you the Shepherd of Hermes. Well, the Shepherd of Hermes tells people, number one, take 
the name of the beast. Take, You're kidding. Right. It says, take the mark of the beast. It said, give up to the beast. Form a one world government. It says to do all these things. So I suspect in the last days, they'll stick this right in here, the shepherd of Hermes. People will open it up in apostate dead churches that, where people haven't been saved for 100 years. And they'll say, oh, you know, you take... Oh, you take this mark of these. As a matter of fact, the NIV now. Because it will be in the Bible. That's right. That's right. That's right. So that's how they'll get everyone right. to take it. Not everyone, but right. the majority. Right. The NIV now is already starting to make some changes. Um, it used to say the name of the Lord. Okay, mm -hmm. in a lot of places. Small name, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The new printings of the NIV are dropping of the Lord. And it just says name. And then they capitalize name. Okay, and it says not to take the name of, you know, 666 yes. name, or sure. not to take the 666 name. But they're getting rid of the of the Lord, and they're capitalizing name in the most recent printings of the NIV. And it could be name of anybody. That's right, that's right. Well, it says, you know, to take a name of the beast on your yeah. hand or on your forehead. It's the number of man and his name, yeah. you know. But the NIV does something else that's very, very frightening. Um, a gentleman who invented the uh, positive identification microchip, he's a born-again Christian now. His name's Carl Sanders. You're kidding. Right, and he, when he was working on this committee, he thought to himself, and he looked up in the Bible, he says, I think you're not supposed to take a mark. I better look this up. He looked in one of these new versions, and it said that the mark was on the hand. He says, well, this is okay, because what we're doing is in the hand, okay? The King James says, in yes, the hand. Yes, yes, and the new versions, NIV, all of them say, on the hand. He thought it was okay. Well, now he's going around the country warning people, go back to the King James. It warned you against this positive identification microphone. And he invented it. And he invented it, right, right. So they, they're they using it, I understand, in cattle already. I understand. The little microchips. Right, right, right. right. What do they, they, do they say that Jesus will return? That's completely out. He will not return. Well, it'll be another Jesus. You know, the Bible talks oh, about okay. if any come and preach another oh, Jesus. Okay. So it will be this religious leader who's the false prophet, and then it will be this political leader who brings all the world together for peace. So we stay on this earth. This is our final... Resting they think place. this is it. That's right, what I mean. Right. Sort of like Hitler was looking for the thousand sure. year whatever, you know? Yeah. He, they're going to make peace on earth and make everything perfect and take the mark and we'll make everything smooth and you won't need to carry your credit card around and, and have your new, new, new international version and what will be so watered down. Okay. And, what will they do to people that have King James Version of the Bible? <laughs> I guess it's concentration camps. I don't really know. Sure. Uh, that's what they'll do. <laughs> and they'll burn these. They'll burn our Bible. That's right. That's right. I think you're, you're very right, Joanne. People that have just started studying the Bible, what would you recommend? New King James Version? Always? Um, always the King James. You think not it's the, the new one King that, James. yeah, yeah. Right. The old King James Version. The old King James Version. Don't be fooled by the new King James yeah. Version. It's right. completely different. Right, it's completely different. It has I mean, arrows in it. It has a lot of arrows. Your book tells step by step, new ver different versions, how they differ. Right. And they can read for themselves. Right, right. How do they get this book? Um, they can write to um, our post office box, which mm -hmm. is 280 um, okay. Ararat, A R A R A T, Virginia. Okay. And the zip is 24053. And we also have an 800 number. Okay. Uh, no one will be there till Wednesday. And, but, okay, uh, we'll be giving that. Okay. We've got another hour to go. Okay. Call in your questions because this is very interesting. We don't want to be misled. The Living Bible came out, I don't know how many years ago, but it doesn't seem that many years ago, but it was given to young people especially mm -hmm. so that they could, uh, for graduation presents and all, so they could learn the Word of God better. Is it a good translation? Well, the Living Bible is probably one of the worst things you could give a child. For many years, the Living Bible had a lot of curse words in it and that you wouldn't want your little child to read sure. or to pick up. Now, they've sure. finally taken them out, but there are a lot of copies in print that still have all those curse words sure. in it. But something interesting happened to Mr. Taylor and to four or five other gentlemen who wrote these new versions. Um, they've lost their ability to speak. Okay. Now, remember... Are you kidding? No. Remember um, Zachariah? Yes. When the angel came to him... And he said uh, that he was going to have a son, and yes. he didn't believe him. He laughed. And he said, because thou believest not my words. And he couldn't speak. Well, Mr. Taylor's lost his ability to speak. It was reported in Time magazine some years ago, but he's not the only one. New version editor after new version editor apparently are losing their ability to speak. It's, it appears that God is continuing to judge them on these sorts of things. Um, 
some of your listeners have probably heard of J.B. Phillips' translation. He has a book called The Price of Success. And in that book, he talks about how he lost his ability to speak. And that's why the book is called The Price of Success. And so he had to quit traveling around and quit doing all sorts of things like this because he lost his ability to speak. For no reason. No, for no, no reason disease. at all. No disease. No, no, no. Isn't that something? Um, the gentleman who wrote the Greek text underlying the NIV and the NASB, B.F. Westcott, lost his ability to speak. Um, it's all documented in, in my book, New Age Bible Versions, but there are half a dozen of these men who have lost their ability to speak. And it appears that because they've tampered with the Word of God, even, even Taylor's, said that he believes it was because he tampered with the Word of God. And that, that's in Time Magazine. I've got the quote in oh, my book. Oh, so that's all in your book. Right, right. You, you tell all that. Uh -huh. So it's kind of, if a if, if young man lost his ability to speak from writing the Living Bible, I don't think I'd give it to a little child. I don't think, I, I think I'd quit writing it. I would draw back, <laughs> I'd take back all that I had written. <clears throat> my, that is serious. Right. Okay, I'm going to, we've got some questions here, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And then I want you to look in the camera and speak to the people. Okay. Because I don't want to load you down with just questions and not give you a chance to share of what is happening to our Bible okay. and what the people are trying to push down our throats. Let me ask you, oh, someone called in, what is the difference in KJV <laughs> in Greek and Hebrew? Okay, um, I'm not quite sure exactly what the, what the qu caller is asking. What's well, the I difference sure between KJV know. and Greek? So you, okay. you tell me what you think. <laughs> we'll give our best shot. Okay. Um, I'll give you a little history of the Greek text okay. and the Hebrew text underlying okay. the King James Bible. Um, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, mm -hmm. and the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we have 5,000 approximately manuscripts that attest to the words in the Greek New Testament. Of those 5,000, 99 and 44 hundredths percent agree with the King James readings. They have all of these, the Trinity, King, uh, they have um, uh, the deity of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. they have how you're saved, they have all of these things in those 5,000 manuscripts. There are less than a handful, less than what you could count on your hands, that agree with the new versions. And so this kind of Greek text type, that underlies the new versions yeah. has really never been used by the church before. Oh. The, the church throughout history, from the time the Bible was written uh, in Antioch, it uh, moved up into the Italic Bible in um, northern Italy. Then uh, a Waldensian pastor took that Italic Bible. His name was Olivetan. He translated that into French. And so we have the French Olivetan Bible. He was a relative of John Calvin. So they took that French Olivetan Bible and translated the Calvin Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, the German Luther Bible, or actually it was the Teppel Bible at that time, was taken from this old uh, Latin type, which was taken from the Greek from Antioch and Syria. Mm -hmm. And the Greek Orthodox Church only uses this Greek type of text underlying the King James. It's called the Textus Receptus. It's sometimes called the Majority Text. It's sometimes called the Byzantine Text. It's got a lot of different Greek text names. But essentially, um, all of the Bibles around the world, for the most part, that are used by Christians have this Greek text underlying them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, the, the false Greek text was created in Alexandria, Egypt. After the time of Christ, there was a school there. And there were some pagans, uh, Philo, Saccas, Clement, Origen, okay? What they tried to do was merge Christianity with paganism. And in the process of doing that, what they did was what we see, what I was talking about yes. in the last hour, where you say God who created all things, but you have to take by Jesus Christ out because that wouldn't merge with paganism, okay? Yeah. And so they started dropping these 64,000 words. Actually, in the Greek text, it's only 8,000 words that they changed. But Origen changed the Bible to kind of um, merge the two together. Now, Origen's Greek text moved up to Caesarea. When he was, Origen was found a heretic by a church council where he was living. They kicked him out. He moved up to Caesarea, and his Bible, his Hexapla, Origen's Greek Hexapla, was taken by the Roman church at that time, Constantine, was the um, emperor. Eusebius was his false prophet. There's always a false prophet yes, there. Yes. And Eusebius took that and by the hand of Pamphilius, which was the scribe, copied Origen's Bible. So 
and it even says by the hand of Pamphilius at the end of this Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts. So when you see the footnotes in the new versions where it says the best Greek text, and that's what your caller was asking about what Greek text mm -hmm. it came from. When it says the best Greek text, that's a very subjective opinion of a few scholars because the best is always, in their opinion, this Vaticanus and Sinaiticus manuscripts which came from Origen who was a kind of semi-Aryan, Gnostic, Platonist, you know. So very, he'd very much fit in a New Age or into a Unity-type church, yeah. you know. And so they take, took that text type, but that text type sat, Purdue, no one using it from around 300 to about 1881. No one ever used this, this Greek text type because Christians could look at it and they could see this wasn't the Bible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Bible says in the last days there'll be a falling away. Take heed that no man deceive mm -hmm. you. There'll be a falling away first. They've got to pull out the foundation. Before you can have, a fall, have someone fall, you've got to pull the rug out from That's underneath right. them. The only way you can do that is at the foundation. And the Bible is our foundation. So they've pulled it away. And in 1881, two gentlemen following the higher criticism that was happening in Germany. In the German schools there, there were some Aryans. Those are people that don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. There were Unitarians, people who don't believe also in the deity of Jesus Christ. They were teaching at the theological schools in Germany then. In England, two uh, priests in the Anglican Church at that time, whose names were Westcott and Hort, took some of their notions about higher criticism, about how we should change the Bible and whatever, mm -hmm. took this Vaticanus Greek manuscript, this Sinaiticus Greek manuscript, and changed that historic Greek text. Now, Kenyon, who's the, the uh, director of the British Museum, he said that until 1881, this text, this majority Greek text, held the you know, view. Everyone used that until 1881 when these two gentlemen took it and they changed the Bible, the Greek Bible, to match this corrupted edition. So the church had never ever used that for almost 2,000 years. But as it turns out, when we read the life and letters of B.F. Westcott, the life and letters of uh, Fenton John Anthony Hart, which were two bishops, brilliant men, brilliant scholars, um, they were Neoplatonists. Okay? They agreed with Origen's Neoplatonism. In fact, as a matter of fact, if you go to, anyone can go to their city library, because you have lots of libraries around here because of all the universities. Look in the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics. Look under Alexandrian Theology. You will find them there, Westcott and Hort, under mysticism, Alexandrian mysticism. And the other person that you will find there is Philo. Now, if you go to the library, you find Philo starting the school, the offshoot in the... Uh, liberal Christian world is Westcott and Hort in this Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics. If you go and look at the Encyclopedia of um, Myth and Magic, they will start with Philo, and then they will go off into Madame Blavatsky in the New Age movement. Mm -hmm. And so the same root in Alexandria has sort of blossomed oh, out. Mm -hmm. And what happened with the Greek text in 1881 is uh, these two gentlemen made 8,000 changes. Now, they had a few people, Tregellis and some, Alfred and some of these people working before them, but essentially, they made the change. And when they did, there was an outcry. Dean Bergen, a lot of the scholars, said, this is a new Greek text. They called it the new Greek text. And so when you read all the books back in that period, they said, why are we getting this new Greek text? But it worked its way into Princeton University in the United States. Several men, uh, Macon and Warfield, went over and studied at the German school. Mm -hmm. And they brought back, not the higher criticism, but the lower criticism, the textual criticism. They brought it back into Princeton. And then we had men like A.T. Robertson, who are, a lot of these men are, are, I believe, are truly Christian men. But they went into the tree of wisdom with the serpent hanging there. Mm -hmm. And they listened to, yea, hath God said. And they started making changes one by one by one. And this corrupt Greek text moved into the seminaries and then we had the Revised Standard Version, and then we had the American Standard Version. And it's interesting, the American Standard Version was started by Philip Schaff, or created, we'll say, by Philip Schaff and his committee. Philip Schaff is another gentleman who lost his voice completely, okay? But Philip Schaff started something that we just all saw happen in Chicago not too long ago, the Parliament of World Religions. He started that with a group of liberals back in, in the, about 1900, Hmm. where all the Hindus and all the people are meeting together. And 
he started the American Standard Version, and then the new American Standard Version is really just sort of an update from the American Standard Version. An interesting thing happened. If I can um, read a quote from the gentleman who was um, very uh, much a part of the foundation of the New American Standard Bible. His name was Franklin Logsdon, and he must have truly loved the Lord, and he must have had a good heart for the Lord. He and Dewey Lockwood started the New American Standard Bible. And then Franklin Logsdon read a book called Which Bible? And then he read another book called True or False. And they say very much the same thing that my book says, okay? Mm -hmm. But after he read that book, this gentleman who was at the very foundation of the New American Standard, as a matter of fact, if you buy a New American Standard today at the bookstore, the preface was written by Franklin Logsdon. But this is what he said, if I can read it for your listeners. He said, I must under God renounce every attachment to the New American Standard Version. I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. We laid the groundwork. I wrote the format. I helped interview some of the translators. I sat with the translators. I wrote the preface. I'm in trouble. I can't refute these arguments. It's wrong. It's terribly wrong, and what am I going to do about it? Then he said, I used to laugh with others. However, in attempting to answer, I began to sense that something was not right about the new American Standard Version. And then he went on to say, the finest leaders that we have today haven't gone into it just as I hadn't gone into it. And so uh, what we have now are two men who are on the new King James Committee who have come back around, back to the King James. One of them after he read my book and some other books, and one of them just on his own after he saw how the new King James came out. But we have men who have been on these committees who, after they've read my book, sort of realize this is wrong. They just didn't realize that they hadn't you know, gone into the research about Westcott and Hort and the fact that, as I was mentioning about Westcott and Hort, um, who created this new Greek text that underlies the new versions with so many things missing, they were spiritualists, which means they tried to make contact with the dead. They were very liberal churchmen at their time. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, Westcott was a representative for a brewery. So if you look at the Sunday paper, um, his picture would be there and he would be advertising beer. And so mm. this is the kind of man you know, that's taking 8,000 words from the Greek text of the Bible. Um, the other question that the person asked was about the Hebrew Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Okay, Now, the King James came from something called the ben Hakim Rabbinic Bible. It was written around 1500. Now, it wasn't written around 1500. This is the one that came from Isaiah, the prophets, and all the old, the men of old. Okay, mm -hmm. Now, something interesting happened. In 1937, um, Rudolf Kittel changed the traditional Hebrew Bible. Okay, now, Rudolf Kittel is from Germany. Rudolf Kittel was anti-Semitic. His family did not like the Jewish people, so much so that his son, Gerhard Kittel, was tried and convicted of war crimes for the death of 5,000 of Europe's Jewry. And so this Rudolf Kittel was actually tried. He was Hitler's sort of high priest, oh. propaganda high priest. He would write the propaganda why we should kill the Jews. And then um, the people would read it and they were getting brainwashed about this. But this was the son of Rudolf Kittel who changed the Old Testament. So now we have the New King James Version having the uh, Biblica Hebraica Stuttgartensia underlying their Old Testament. Why would we want an Old Testament written by people who hate the Jews? You know, why wouldn't we want the traditional Hebrew uh, ben Hakim Rabbinic Bible, the, the new one that was created in 18, uh, 1937. This is 1937. This is just at the peak of anti-Semitism in Ger Germany, just at the peak of when they were beginning to kill people, you know, kill the Ger German people. Mm. Now, so like in the NIV, we have an Old Testament that's been changed in a number of places by this anti-Semitic person who is um, Rudolf Kittel. Then his son comes along, Gerhard Kittel, writes something called the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Okay. Now, it's a 10-volume work that gives the um, etymology for all the Greek words in the New Testament. And so what happened there was his son, um, Gerhard, brought all of the pagan ideas into lexical information. So what you find today when you go to a bookstore and buy a lexicon is that we are not getting the historic Judeo-Christian meanings behind things. We are getting Rudolf Kittel's pagan notions about things. He added... Being brainwashed. Right, right, words. right. So people will look at a lexicon and they'll say, 
well, you know, the lexicon agrees with the new versions. Well, the reason it does is because they've gone to this ultra-liberal, um, half-pagan, half-Christian lexical information. And then when they look at it, they take out only the pagan information. Now, that's what they're doing with um, the monogenes, only begotten son. They used to look at the uh, monogenes, and they used to look at the lexical information, and they would say, this means begotten. Now they're looking at monogenes, and they're saying, they're looking at the pagan things like the trimorphic protonoia and things like that mm -hmm. and saying this means something different, one and only, or something very pagan. When your book came out, what was said about it? Oh, lots of things. I received, I've got about a thousand letters from people. And Good or bad? I've only gotten two bad letters, and that's the honest really? truth. I've only gotten two bad letters. Maybe the, I pray the Lord he'll intercept the bad ones at the post office, so maybe he does. But I've only gotten maybe two or three what were the bad two bad letters. ones what did they say one was a, a rock group somebody was a in a rock, rock group, group and they were uh, a roman catholic and they were sure i couldn't be right you know that was yeah. one and the other one was from um a gentleman who was on the new king james old testament committee mr oh, price uh -huh. those are the, really the only two now there, there there may be a handful of others I, uh -huh. i'm really not remembering but i oh, have that is amazing thousands of uh mm, let it go <laughs> okay thousands of letters from people that say thank you so much you know for doing all this research i didn't realize you know mm -hmm. what was happening and uh, you know i really appreciate it and some of them from very prominent individuals mm -hmm. for instance the people who own the um niv video exclusive video rights have called me up and said, since we read your book, we can no longer do this video production of the NIV that we were planning to do. And so mm -hmm. they've had to change their mind. Um, uh, the Canadian Council of Evangelical Protestant Churches in uh, September passed a rev resolution that um, they recommended the book New Age Bi Bible Versions, and they mm -hmm. recommended everyone go back to the King James Version. Now, this is the whole entire Canadian Council of Evangelical Protestant Churches voted to do this. And mm -hmm. so um, lots of prominent individuals have you know, written and called. But uh, the, the letters I appreciate the most are yeah. just from the sweet people who just say... That appreciate what that the work you've You've helped done. me so much, yeah. and you don't know what a mess my life was in. And, and yeah. they sound like my students that say That's good. that were so messed up, and now they're okay. That's good. You know, they're back to the King James. Gail, what about the Amplified Bible? Okay, the gentleman who was on the Amplified Version Committee, that being um, Franklin Logsdon, when he renounced the New American Standard Version, mm -hmm. he also renounced the Amplified Bible. Mm -hmm. And so, um, going by what he said, I guess I would also have to say that it's probably a bad thing, only because, remember it says, if you add unto these things, yes. I'll add unto you the plagues that are written in this yes. book. And so we don't really, now, now as a commentary, it's all right to call it yes. a commentary, but it isn't the pure word of God. And so we all have so and little... commentaries have their place to That's explain. Right. right. But, um, okay, uh, someone wants to know where they can, your book can be purchased locally, and that's with the Crossway Bookstore and the Lake Forest Shopping Center. And those of you from out of town, Lake Forest Shopping Center is right behind Bob Jones University on Highway 291, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> what about um, International Children's Bible? And the Picture Bible. Okay. By, I think you got that one by Mr. Cook. Yes, I think the Picture said. Bible? Yeah. Woman asked, is the I'm picture here. Bible? Yeah. Okay. One of those. Woman asked, is the Picture Bible book? <clears throat> by David Cook, is your book sold in bookstores? Okay, about the International Children's Bible. You know, there, I don't know why they make some of the changes they do in some of these, but in Daniel, the International Children's Bible, do you know the chapters in Daniel that are prophetic, that talk mm -hmm. about who's coming against who in the end times? Okay, in the International Children's Bible, they change who's the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the documentation with me today, but when I saw that, I thought, you know, the, 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 whoever the bad guy is and the good guy, they've got them switched in the International Children's Bible. So I'd strongly uh, recommend staying away from that. I think uh, mothers will find, I have a little seven-year-old girl, and she has always read the King James Bible. She has no problems with it. And so I think that, you know, the Bible says, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. Mm -hmm. And in Galatians, it says, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, mm -hmm. peace. And so if we want our children to have love, joy, peace, they need to have actual contact with the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. And I believe they get that through reading the Bible, because he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. Yes. And so those little children need it because they're, you know, anyone who has any little kids know that, the, you know, they got the devil in them. There's no question about That's that. Right. And um, they, they, need, they need the Word of God ministering to them. They need love. They need peace. That's they right. need joy. And they need the truth. 
someone called in and said, uh, what is a good version of the Bible? And what do you say, Gail, to that? Right. I believe the King James Version is the Bible. That's not the New King James. That's the King James the Version. Oh, King James. <laughs> the King James the Version. People want to know where they can receive your book, uh, the New Age Bible Versions. They can receive it right here in the city of Greenville in, at Crossway uh, Bookstore. And also that you have a number that they can call. Right. What is that? Um, after Wednesday, if they want to write this down with a pencil, mm -hmm. they can call one 800 435 Four five, three five. Okay. And they can get that book, and then I also have another book. Yeah, and you're available. going to be talking about that in just a moment. Here is a lady that didn't want her name given from Greer, 25 years of age, just accepted Jesus as her Savior. Oh. Isn't that wonderful? That's worth the trip down here, Gail. <laughs> That's what it's all about. That's right. <laughs> okay. We're going to be praying for prayer requests, and we're going to be uh, holding them up in prayer. But I don't want Gail to come all this way and not feel like she has given what was on her heart. Now, we could pick her brain and ask questions all night, and that's fine. But I want to give her about five, at least five minutes, five or ten minutes, to tell you what she's got on her heart. New Age is creeping in on every side. With every method, every way they can, they're trying to take over. So many people, including Gail, is raising up that, way, that red flag and saying, hey, there's danger. Let's, let's take a listen here. And I'm glad God sent you our way. <laughs> so I want you to look in the camera and tell the people tonight what you'd like to tell them. Speak from your heart. Oh. What's on your heart? Okay. Well, we just had a, a few questions here that really line up with exactly what I was thinking. Okay. The first question was, um, what about the new King James Version. And so I want to make it clear to everyone that the new King James is not the old King James. And I'll give you some examples. Um, in Acts chapter 3 and in Acts chapter 4, in several places, the new King James denies the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of calling him God's son, it calls him his servant. Okay, now we know oh. Moses is God's servant. I'm God's servant and you're God's servant. But uh, when you read the book of Acts, chapter 1, chapter 2, you're moving up to chapter 3. It's very um, developmental there. And we're proving that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They changed that to servant. Now, the interesting thing about that is that Greek word there that's translated servant by those versions, in other places in the New Tra Testament, they translate it um, son. So they know that that word has a range of meanings. And it appears what's happening in the new versions is that many Greek words have a range of meanings. But they will tend to follow the lexical information that gives the liberal, watered-down interpretation. So you can't find that in a lexicon. But then why do they translate that son someplace else when they're talking about the centurion's son or someone else's son? So that's a problem. The other problem with the New King James is that... Um, the Godhead, they've taken that out, okay? And they have that divine nature again that we talked about earlier. So they're, they're, they're watering down the Trinity in the New King James. Um, the New King James takes the precious word comforter and they change it to helper. Now the problem with that is the word helper is the word that the Jehovah Witness New World Translation has always used for the Holy Spirit because they think he's just a force, a helper. He is not part of the Godhead. And so they just call him a helper. So now the New King James is saying the exact same thing that the Jehovah Witness Bible is saying. Um, the New King James also changes the end of the world to the end of the age. Okay. Now, you know, if, there's the en if the end of the world is coming, or if there's going to be an end to this world, a person had better get ready. They better be prepared to receive Jesus Christ or, you know, to meet their maker, to be prepared for uh, Revelation chapter 20, the judgment. Uh, where every man shall give an account of himself to God. But in the New King James, they say end of the age. Now that Greek word, eon, can be translated world. It can also be translated age. But what the King James does is it takes that world and within the context gives it a definition based on whether they're talking about space or whether they're talking about time. Because in the lexical information, it couldn't be either way. Okay, so, but the New King James tends to the liberal on that. The other thing that the New King James does is it omits hell probably about 30 times. Now, if you said to a young high school student, there's a hell, do you want to go to hell? They would say no. Because I believe God has put in the English language within our culture a fear 
a mental picture of what hell is. And Jesus loved us so much that he died that we wouldn't have to go there. And so a person, a young person would be frightened and they'd say, no, I don't want to go to hell. But the New King James has changed that to Hades, okay? And if you said to a young high school person, do you want to go to Hades? Number one, they wouldn't have the faintest idea what you said. It would have absolutely no impact. The reason we know it would have no impact is because when young people swear, they don't say Hades. <laughs> they say hell. That's that right. word has a lot of power and a lot of impact within the semantic range of our culture. And the other thing that would happen if they went to a secular university, at that secular university they would learn that Hades is the intermediate stage between reincarnations or whatever. And the problem with that um, translating in Hades is that is the literal Greek word there. Hades is a transliteration. So they're not translating Hades into the English language to be understood within our culture. They're leaving it untranslated. Now the problem with that is they don't transliterate Uranus, which is heaven. They translate heaven, that's fine. But uh, in a book um, called the NIV, The Making of a Contemporary Translation, they talk about why they don't translate it. Because different denominations have different thinking about what this is, and so we're going to let each person come up with it for themselves. Well, I think mm. if Jesus Christ would die on the cross for our sins, mm. have them pull his beard out, go through so much pain to save us from hell, we'd better be pretty sure what it is, because okay. Jesus was pretty sure about what it is. Okay. Um, the other thing that the New King James does that uh, makes me very frightened when children use it is instead of saying straight is the way, they change straight is the way to difficult is the way. Oh. Okay. Now, they're talking about salvation there. We know being yeah. a Christian, life is difficult. There's no question about mm -hmm. it. But that verse, the context, is not talking about our life as a Christian. It's talking about salvation. How are we saved? Being saved is easy. We believe on the Lord Jesus yes. Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Mm -hmm. Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart mm -hmm. that God has raised him from the dead, that. thou shalt be saved. And so that's easy to do. But the New King James says, difficult is the way. Now, uh, the NIV does something in Mark chapter 10, verse 24, and Mark chapter 10, verse 21 that changes how we perceive salvation. One of the other questions that came in was how do the new versions change the plan of salvation. And in Mark chapter 10, verse 24, where the King James says, Children, how hard it is for them who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. He's talking to the rich young ruler there. The new versions take out for them that trust in riches. And they just say, Children, how hard it is to enter into the kingdom of God. Mm. I would never want a little child to yeah. think it was hard to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, in 1024 in Mark, um, God is giving that rich young ruler the option. Don't trust in your riches. Trust in salvation through the cross. And he goes on to say, come, take up the cross and follow me. So he's telling him, don't trust in riches. Trust in the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm going to die for sins. Trust in the cross. The new versions take out, uh, take up the cross. And they just say, come follow me. And that's the only place where take up the cross is in the Bible, the cross. Now, other places it'll say his cross, uh, but it's not talking about his cross there because um, the Bible says let a man deny himself and take up his cross. When they talk about his cross, they're talking about the cross that each of us take up every day, denial of the flesh, denial of the self. Okay, but when we're talking about taking up the cross, we're talking about salvation. First, we take up the cross. We receive Jesus as our Savior, and then a man can take up his cross every day, deny himself, okay? So, in Mark chapter 10, 21 and 24 there, we have a completely different plan of salvation shown. And then another example of how they've changed the plan of salvation would be John chapter 6, verse 47. And the King James says, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life, okay? They take out the on me, and they just say, he that believeth hath everlasting life. So you can believe in crystal power, Mary power, mm -hmm. uh, Buddha, anyone. They take out on me. And the other thing that some of them will do, where it says believe in him, like in Mark uh, 9, 42, and uh, John 3, 15, and 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Instead of saying believe in him, they'll take the in him and they'll move to another part of the sentence. And when they move to another part of the sentence, they're teaching, now theo the theologians know what this is, but the average person doesn't know. It's called inclusive theology. And in inclusive theology, they believe that Jesus did die for everyone's sins, but 
you don't have to do anything about it. It's just sort of automatic. That's why the new versions, instead of saying preach the gospel, they say proclaim the gospel. In other words, you just tell people, Jesus, you know, you ought to be happy. Jesus died for your sins. You're going to heaven, as if it was sort of an automatic thing. But uh, we know that it isn't an automatic thing. But so instead of saying believe in him, you'll have eternal life, they just say he, you know, who believes has in him eternal life. They'll switch it around so it isn't really saying the same thing. Um, now, we know that we have redemption through his blood, okay, in Colossians 1.14. And the new versions have taken out in his blood. Mm. And so it just says in whom we have redemption. Because in his blood is much too narrow. It's much too much the Christian way of doing things. And so we've got to water that down. Mm. Um, the other thing that they'll take out is in 1 Peter 4.1, where it says Jesus suffered for us. They'll drop the for us. So in other words, it's not really our fault. He's not really paying our price. He's not really bearing our sins. He is just suffering. They'll take out the for us. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the King James says he was sacrificed for us. Okay? They'll take off the for us so that he was just sacrificed. Um, in Romans 3, 25, it talks about through faith in his blood. And the New American Standard Bible <clears throat> will just switch that around and, and have faith, but the faith isn't in his blood. And so uh, Virginia Mollencott, who was a stylist on the NIV committee, said at a recent meeting of uh, um, lesbian women, she's a self-confessed lesbian, and she said at this meeting, I can no longer worship in a context that uh, serves a God who is an abusive parent. In other words, she sees the Jesus dying on the cross as the father abusing the son. And she was a stylist oh. on the NIV committee. Now, mm. uh, Christianity Today magazine um, had a picture of a conference that she attended. And there was a picture of something called the heart of the beast. And all these woman, women at this lesbian conference, it was so-called Christian, but I mean, of course it wasn't, were worshiping this thing called the image of the beast. Now, this was documented in, in Christianity Today magazine, where she's saying that she believes God is, a, is not he and not she. God is the one, capital O-N-E. And so we see in the new versions, the sun is moving out, John 1.14, John 1.18, and it's becoming the one and only, this kind of God of the heathens. And if you look at the literature of the pagan world, you look at the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, you look at the... Uh, the Vedas, the Hindu Vedas. Um, even if you look at the uh, Muslim literature, their God has always been called the One, capital O-N-E. And so now this name is moving into the Christian Bible. You know, uh, the New Agers have always said that we need a semantic bridge to bring the world religions all together. And we need common names for things. So what's happening in New Age literature is that Buddha is disappearing, Buddha being uh, the prophet over in the east, uh, Krishna is disappearing. And even in the Luciferian literature, Lucifer's name is disappearing. And they're being replaced by the Lord, the Christ, the One, and the Spirit. Okay? Now, we're seeing a parallel move within the new versions, where it's not Jehovah anymore, it's just the Lord. It's not Lord Jesus Christ, it's just the Lord. Or where it's not Jesus Christ, it's just the Christ. They've taken, they've separated Christ from Jesus about 43 times in the NIV and in the mm -hmm. new versions because they want this Lord, the Christ, the One, and the Spirit rather than the personal identity of the historic God of the Old Testament, which is Jehovah, and the God of the New Testament, which is the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Now, I can give you uh, some examples of what they're doing. You know, it says, who is Antichrist? All right, that's a question. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is antichrist. Okay, now look what happens to the new versions as far as the Christ is concerned. Romans 1.16, the King James Bible said the gospel of Christ. Okay, they take off of Christ. It's just the gospel now. Christ is gone. All right. Second example, um, 2 John 9, abideth in the doctrine of Christ. The King James Bible has the whole thing. The new versions take off of Christ. It's gone. Um... Galatians 6, 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. The new versions omit, For in Christ Jesus. 
he's coming out again. Uh, Galatians 4, 7. We are an heir of God through Christ. It's only through the Lord Jesus Christ that we can do this. Mm -hmm. The NIV takes out in Christ. We're just an heir of God. In Christ is gone again. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 7. I speak the truth in Christ. The NIV, in Christ is gone again. Over and over and over again, 43 times, they take Christ away from Jesus Christ, the, the, the connection of the two of them. So they're trying to separate Jesus from Christ so that we just have a man named Jesus and an entity or a Christ pole that came on Jesus and left, and that's why they take out uh, Christ so often when it's in Luke, you know, the end of Luke and the end of Mark, and the Christ pole can fall on anyone. And so when it falls on this coming Antichrist, uh, he will be the new Christ. They're expecting a Christ, you know, for this new age. The new versions change. And don't, when Jesus said, I, Lo, I will be, th be with you always, even to the end of the world, they change that to say, Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Wow. Okay? And so they say that we get a new Christ for every age. And so they're expecting in, in the year 2000 the Piscean Christ to leave, Pisces being the fish. And we're going to have the Christ of the age of Aquarius. And we're going to have, this will be the Antichrist. But sure. they will think it's Jesus Christ. That's how he will come in. I, I believe so. It's a plan, isn't it, Gail? Well, I, I believe that the serpent has wanted to be worshipped. You know, in Isaiah 14, he said five times, I will. He said, I will be like the Most High. You know, the serpent, when he uh, sinned, mm -hmm. he didn't say, I will be like Charles Manson. Yeah. He said, I will be like the Most High. He wanted to be like God. Yes, well, will. in the new versions, he became Jesus Christ because they took his name out of that horrible diatribe against him where you'll be cast down to hell, Isaiah 14. Mm -hmm. And there it says the morning star. He got changed to the morning star. Well, in New Age literature, Lucifer is called the morning star. And so I believe that it says in Revelation chapter uh, 13, it says the whole world worshipped the dragon. Now, how do you get the whole world, the yeah. whole world, to worship the dragon? Ugly dragon. Right. Now, we know the dragon is that old serpent, the devil. Revelation mm -hmm. tells us who the dragon is. It's the devil. But the secret is in Revelation 12, where it says, He deceiveth the whole world. It's deception. Mm. All right? Uh, he's deceived the scholars on some of these new version committees. Um, you know, he's deceived lots of people. And it has to be a plan of deception. I don't believe anyone's sitting around purposely saying, Let's make these versions evil. I believe they move under the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The serpent is right there to whisper, Yea, hath God said. And the serpent will tell them just what to take out and just what to put in. And I believe they're just pawns. You know, I don't believe that. I believe the conspiracy is on the part of Lucifer who said, I will be like the Most High. He wants to rule this planet. He wants to be the God. He's called the God of this world, small mm -hmm. g in the Bible. And he wants to defeat Jesus Christ. He wants to take over this planet. He wanted to be... Mm -hmm. He, would, he said he would exalt his star above the throne of God. He yes. wanted to be above God. How do these new versions handle divine healing? You know, the, the Bible says that by his stripes we are healed. Right. Well, the, how do they handle that? I didn't notice any changes there. The only thing I noticed okay. between the new versions and the King James were signs were very often changed to miracles. There was a switching there. Okay. And I think there's probably some doctrinal import there. But... Um, basically, when I was working on the book, I dealt with the basics of the Christian faith, and then I could see that there were changes that would affect every level of what we believe, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't fit in the 700-page book. It was getting too yeah. big. Are you going to and write so, another book? Well, I've written... Um, you asked well, me if us, I'd mention yes, this. Yes, yes, I want you to. Um, I've written this book. It's called Which Bible is God's Word? And um, you can get this from the 800 number that I gave. Mm -hmm. Or right. um, Does Crossway have this book as well? I'm not sure that they have this one yet. It's on order? They'll order it. Oh, okay. okay. They'll order it. Okay. You can, they can get this from the 800 number if uh -huh. they want to also, or from our P.O. Box in Ararat, Virginia. Mm -hmm. But um, I wrote this book to answer some of the questions that people had after New Age Bible versions mm -hmm. came out. And um, this was based on some radio interviews that I did with Southwest Radio Church that may That's have been... That's where I heard you. What you heard. Yes. Okay. This Driving was... down the road, <laughs> and I said, who is this lady? Yeah. <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact, um, AV Publications and Ararat has available um, those radio interviews as well as um, 32 other radio interviews in the cassette album. So if anyone wants to hear those radio shows yeah. that you heard, very good. they can very write to good. AV Publications and they'll get that for them. Okay. All right, we have just a few more minutes. We're going to uh, call Gwen over. Gwen, if you'll come over, tell her, please. 
to come on over. We're going to share some of the prayer requests. Uh, your first book, let's tell them about it. New Age Bible Versions. How long did it take you to write this book? Uh, it took me six years, full-time research. Six years? <laughs> I would have given up before then. What kept you going? <laughs> Uh, I just, I just love people, heart. I love people, and I just want to ha see them ha know the precious Lord Jesus Christ and not be deceived. And yeah. you know, remember in the Old Testament, they had cities of refuge, where if you were yes. in trouble, you could go, but the right. law from God was that it had to be a one-day journey. What I found with the new versions is that the journey was too long. They were taking out too much, and that's why we have so many weary Christians, tired Christians, depressed Christians, anxious Christians in the new versions. The journey is too long for them. And I'm afraid, like when Jesus Christ was on the cross, they offered him uh, wine mixed with myrrh. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they're, he was suffering. And we have a suffering body of Christ today. He, they're offering the church a mixed drink, something sweet with something bitter in there, too. And we don't need anything bitter. Life is much too difficult. <laughs> yeah. And everything that God gives is sweet. It, it truly is. If right. it's really the, really the truth. Uh, what's happening on the phones? Well, yeah. we just had another salvation. Wonderful. Young lady from Anderson, South Carolina, just called in and gave her heart to the Lord. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. That's two salvations tonight. That's right. Here's the other one. That's right. Um, uh, what, would you read some prayer requests? I sure will. We're going to ask Gail to pray before she goes. Uh, before you read them, uh, Gwen, New Age Bible Version, you must have this book. Uh, you can get it at Crossway Bookstore here, or we'll put up the... Can we put up the address at the end of the program? Gail's address? Okay. Well, you can give give the address. So you can, okay. And if you if you want it, you can call, and uh, a counselor will give it to you. Uh, this, you need this book. Uh, she can't possibly cover six years of work in two hours. There's just no way. But we want to be ready. We don't want to miss the coming of the Lord. That's right. And uh, it's so important. And if there's someone that you know that's confused on uh, what Bible to read and what to believe, you need to get them this, this book or tell them where they can get it. And Gail, will you come back and be with us sometimes? I'd be honored. Thank you. I'd okay. You've done a beautiful job, and I just wish we had more time mm -hmm. for you to be on uh, a week or so and we could really get into it. But all that you need to know is right here. And it's very simple. Even I can understand it. And... Uh, if I can understand it, you can understand it. Okay, what are some of the prayer requests? We've had a, a lot of requests tonight. I said, well, we live in a real world because we had a lot of requests tonight for people that are really having problems in the home. Mm -hmm. uh, mothers that husbands have just walked out and left them with children. And yeah. Many, I could, if I've seen one of those tonight, I've seen 20. Family trouble. Yes, many of those. I had a real urgent request a while ago for someone that had back surgery. The surgery went wrong. Oh. And else caused a heart attack, and they've just called in from Anderson, South Carolina. So oh. would you please pray for this person? It was a yes. man that had a heart attack, and a lady suddenly lost her husband yesterday. Called a while ago and said, "Please remember me." A mother called in a while ago, has a son on drugs, and he's just been picked mm -hmm. up. She's just real disturbed over it, and uh, many sicknesses. A young boy in ICU at the hospital down here in Anderson. Just many, many requests, Joanne, tonight. Many with depression. Yes and uh, anxiety. I think a lot of people just, they have called in tonight, especially I noticed you said, when well, would you really pray? I need peace. I just yeah. don't have peace. Yes. And, uh, and I think a lot of that's just from disturbances in the home. That's I what I've so. seen tonight. Yes. It's been the biggest thing. A lot of people can't sleep at night and uh, there's turmoil in their home and uh, I've met many of you downtown in different places and they always say, will you pray that I'll get a good night's sleep? And uh, will you? And it's things on your mind that the devil troubles you by, mm -hmm. and maybe things that you can't even correct or help that you have no nothing to do with. But the devil will drop just a little idea on your mind and keep you awake. But Jesus brings perfect peace, doesn't yes, he? He, does. he is the Prince of Peace, and so don't let any any version of the Bible disturb you if it doesn't <coughs> say he's the Prince of Peace. Lay it down or burn it, because it's it's not of God. And we're going to be praying for those special requests. There's a lot of people that have called in and want you to pray for them tonight. That's right. All right. Um, I would just pray for those ones that, okay. that are hurting. Will you take, take yes. those? Yes. And just pray. 
Dear Father, we come to you in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. And we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you that we can come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in time of need. And we thank you that we can do that through your Son's shed blood on Calvary, Lord. Lord, I pray for those souls that were saved tonight that called in, and also for those who were saved that just prayed a prayer at home, Lord. I pray you put your precious arms around them and make yourself very real to them. Lord, I pray for the widows um, that she mentioned and the widows that called. Lord, you said, thy maker is thy husband. I pray you'd be a husband to them and put your arms around them and be the God of all comfort to them, Lord. And we pray for the man with the back injury, Lord, and, we, and all those that are sick out there and suffering in body, Lord. Um, you said you are the God that healeth thee, and Lord, I pray that you touch their bodies, and Lord, that especially that you touch their hearts, and that you'd give them peace, and that you'd give them comfort through your word tonight, Lord Jesus. And for those who are ha having family problems, Father, I pray that they would run to you for refuge, Lord, and they'd get their King James Bible and open it up, and that you would just pour out your love toward them and just heal their broken heart, Lord. You said you came to heal the brokenhearted, Lord. I pray you'd heal families up and that, that you'd be the hound of heaven and that you'd chase after those who are running so fast away from you, Lord, and I know you do. And we thank you ahead of time for answering these prayers. We thank you for loving us, Lord, and we thank you for this program and the liberty that we've had here tonight, Lord. And we pray that the enemy wouldn't snatch the seed from anyone and that it would bear precious fruit in days to come, Lord yes. Jesus. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. If you call in a prayer request, we have uh, just prayed for you. If you didn't call in, we still prayed for you, for all the people that are viewing tonight, that your needs will be met. And we would like to thank Gail for coming, Gail Ripplinger, and um, you are, we are going to be praying for you. Thank you. That thank everywhere you. you go, that you'll be sending blessings to everyone. Oh, thank, thank you for the truth. Thank you so much. God bless you, Gwen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank we thank our staff and staff, our counselors, and most of all, we thank Jesus for always being here. God bless you. Joanne Thompson say good night for Nightline. Get up and raise your hands. Oh, thanks to the Lord. Cause you know he is good. Oh, he is good.